What's up, you guys? Movie retrospective time. So the movie that won the poll this week, pretty overwhelmingly, was a Tim Burton flick, the 1999 Sleepy Hollow. Pretty good flick. Yeah, I mean, it's not his best one, but I kind of feel like it's one that, I don't know if I'd say like a lot of people don't talk about it, but I remember seeing this when it came out in the theater back in 1999. And I remember really liking it, like it looks fantastic, but being like, mm, I didn't love it. But I think I've developed like more of an appreciation for it, like as I've watched it more times. You know what I mean? Some Tim Burton is just too Tim Burton-y. And this one isn't very Tim Burton-y. I mean, it, it has a lot of his little tropes in it, but it's not... It's not, you know, it's not going over the top. I mean, you know, his wife's in it, like always, and just, you know, some of the same people. But, you know, it's just, just how he does it, you know. And a lot of directors do that, yeah. to be fair. I mean, I know he does get picked on because he puts Johnny Depp in everything. Yeah. But, like I said, a and lot of... Uh, yeah, like a lot of directors, like, have actors yeah. that they particularly like to work with. Yeah. I think maybe the reason that this this isn't Tim Burton-y in the way that... In, in the kind of, like, insulting way that you say that... Yeah. Um is because this initially wasn't really his idea. So this wasn't a movie that he developed from the outset. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The guy that developed this was actually Kevin Yeager, who is a special effects guy. And he was actually the director on Tales from the Crypt, the mm -hmm. HBO series. And he had an idea back in the early 90s that he wanted to do an adaptation of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, the story by Washington Irving, but he wanted to make it like a low budget slasher. He's, he calls it like a pretentious slasher with mm -hmm. like some big, like spectacular kill like every five minutes. And so he was gonna do that. He got like the guy that wrote the screenplay for Seven and they kind of worked together on it. But he pitched it to the studio and they were like, well, we like the idea of doing the Sleepy Hollow thing, but they didn't really get we don't want to make it into a slasher movie. He's like, they kind of wanted to make it like a period piece, like The Crucible or something like that. So he's like, they didn't really get, you know, exactly what his vision was for it, like a low budget thing. So they wanted to go more like a prestige, uh, more independent kind of thing. So that's when Tim Burton got brought in, like in 1998. So it wasn't, I mean, Tim Burton was really into the Sleepy Hollow story. And he even says that when he was still in college, one of his um, teachers was one of the animators that had worked on the Disney Sleepy Hollow. Remember that one? Like the yeah. Ichabod Crane, which, yeah. which probably is the most uh, faithful, like, you I know, I, I really, people. really like the Disney one. Yeah. I really like the Disney one. So, but the thing about that, so he really liked like the he Headless Horseman character, but he wanted to make this, and this was kind of like the, his first kind of straight up horror movie, really, which he, he said he thought that was weird because like horror was his favorite genre, and this was kind of like the first horror movie that he made. But it's kind of like, um, the thing about it is that he, the way it came out, it's really not much of anything like the short story. <laughs> I mean, you know? No. I can but, remember the, I, I remember a bit of the Disney one that I grew up with. I haven't seen that shit in a long time. This is nothing like that from what I remember. Nothing. Not really. There's like a little bit in Some it. Some of the scenes are similar. Where they're like homaging. Yeah. But the thing about it is that Tim Burton wanted to make this more as not like a slavish adaptation, which I'm not, I guess you could make like a, a feature length adaptation. It's a pretty short story and yeah, you know not what a I mean? lot happens in it by today's standards. I mean, yeah, like not a lot happens in it, but it's, you know, so I can see like wanting to make it into a horror movie, but he also wanted to specifically make this as sort of like an homage to Hammer films. So he wanted yeah, to, that. yeah, and I kind of feel like maybe in 1999, I think a lot of people didn't really get that that's what he was going for. You know what I mean? Although this got, like, it made a lot of money. It made, like, 200 million something dollars. And, like, a lot of the critics, most of the critics seem to, like, they say, oh, well, you know, it's not his best one, but it's, like, still pretty good. Like, it's, you know, looks cool and everything. But I think a lot of people back then didn't get that he was homaging Hammer films. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, if you watch it again in that light, it seems, like, super obvious. But he was also homaging stuff like Black Sunday, like the Mario Bava movie. Like, um, he said one of the influences, too, was, like, Scream, Blackula Scream, uh, Jason and the Argonauts. Like, he wanted, so he kind of wanted this sort of, like, expressionist, again, like a hammer kind of look to it. Having all, kind of all these, uh, you know, 
sort of di dignified like British actors like in all these roles and kind of hot he's in it. yeah and and also having like this sort of scientific based character yeah. uh you know kind of chasing the monster yeah so I, I you know in that light it really does kind of work and it does even have like some dark humor in it if you notice too and I actually didn't notice this until I just watched it again last night was that he even goes backwards and makes the blood look like bright red blood like in the hammer movies mm. like instead of like realistic blood yeah. which i was like oh yeah i i guess i didn't even really notice that i liked johnny depp's work in it he i think i thought he did pretty good at that at, the, at this character at ichabod yeah and him set up as a police investigator that was quite a different twist because originally that's not what it was yeah he was a school teacher, a school teacher. in the original story right. now i will say that johnny depp his original idea when they said okay well you want to play ichabod crane even though they the studio said to tim burton well we know that you want johnny depp because we know that's how you do but they're like well how about uh brad pitt or how about liam neeson or and he's like yeah those are nice but yeah we're at, we're doing christopher johnny walken depp. plays the headless horseman he does yeah he, he, they give the little bit of backstory of him being a Hessian mercenary working. Which for that's the from the short story. Yeah, and working for the British, uh, to keeping the American co co uh, colonialists under the fucking yoke of the fucking empire. And he was just bloodthirsty, and he eventually got betrayed and killed by his own sword. And his head was lost, and he's looking for it kind of deal. And he's getting vengeance on people. But then it comes, turns out that the witch has brought him back in this one. Yeah, which kind of I think it's a better kind of a better twist that he was brought back for a reason and then the way it ends is pretty good too kind of a happy ending for the headless horseman i yeah, yeah i guess so gets him a bride well i mean yeah. to be fair she had sold her soul to satan when yeah. she was a kid so he just yeah. came to cash that cash yeah. that in yeah he's he finally gets her get, gets his hands on the witch because like, <laughs> yeah. she is fine going he's back like, to yeah, hell that's we're going right. back Woo. to hell with this yeah, we, yeah, like Miranda Richardson, who yeah. plays the stepmom in this one, uh, she's pretty great. And like I said, she's very over the top, but that's kind of like what, that's the tone that he was going for. Yeah. And I swear to God, that dress that she wears, like that white one with all that black yeah. uh, kind of like embroidery or whatever the hell it is over it, is amazing. Yeah. I would totally wear the shit out of that. But yeah, so... In the sh in the original short story, the the guy like the headless horseman, he was a Hessian mercenary, mm -hmm. but I think his head got blown off by a cannonball, I if remember I remember correctly. Yeah. I mean, I just re I just read it like a year or two ago or something like that. So yeah, I think he, his head got blown off by a cannonball, and then he was just like, but see, in the short story, it's pretty strongly implied that the headless horseman doesn't really exist; that it's just a story. They don't come out and say that, but when, you know, Ichabod Crane gets chased by the Headless Horseman and the Headless Horseman throws the th throws the head at him and then they don't see Ichabod Crane again, you're kind of, it's implied that Brom Bones, the guy that was kind of like vying with Ichabod Crane for Katrina Van Tassel's aff affections, had dressed up like the Headless Horseman and throwing a pumpkin at his yeah. head, like to get rid of, like to scare the shit out of him and get him out of town. Now, I thought, so I thought it was interesting that, I don't know, like this movie almost like thematically completely inverts the point of the original story. In the original story, Ichabod Crane was kind of a douche. Yeah. Um, he's not, I don't know if I'd call him the villain. That's, I guess he is kind of the villain. But he comes into the town and he's, you know, kind of a, kind of a shithead. And then, like, everybody in town is, like, kind of trying to run him out because he's so annoying. You know what I mean? So he's almost kind of like the villain, whereas in this one, he's, like, the hero. He comes into the town and, you know, saves them from the thing. From what I remember, what I remember the original one, I haven't seen it in a long time, he was just kind of a, like you say, he's kind of a douche. Yeah. And um, that was not, uh, he, and he didn't fit in. And during the, time, yeah. during the time that story was written, that was not a virtue to be different. Exactly. Yeah, okay. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, you know, nowadays you got kids saying, "Well, I'm autistic." That kind of, and that's kind of the way damn Ichabod is kind of portrayed. Based nowadays, you say he was he he had autism or something, you know. And that, well, I don't know if I'd go that far, but he was kind. Yeah, he was kind he, of a goofball or kind a of a goof. clod. Well, that's like he didn't really have like a lot of uh, yeah. social grade, and, well, and also he Wes, was very Wes, Wesley. My cousin Wesley has real autism. All right, <laughs> and that motherfucker is goofy. And socially unacceptable, and will do all kinds of shit. And so that I, so I'm correct when I say 
kind of like autism. Uh, just, well, the thing about... He was kind of like, you know, you know, a puppy that won't stop jumping up and down and, hey, hey, oh, oh. He, was, he was like that. And when, that was written at a time in a society where being that way, they discourage people from being that way. It's not what, that's not what society wanted. So the, the story, from, if I remember correctly, kind of pointed out that he was a, he was a goofy son, son of a bitch and, and, and had a swordsman got him. I think that's how it did. Didn't, didn't, didn't the horseman get him? No, I yeah. said that it's pretty strongly implied mm -hmm. that the that Brom Bones mm -hmm. dressed up like the headless horseman mm -hmm. and scared him, so he ran out of town. In the original one, okay. yeah. So okay. they ran him out of town. Okay. But what I, the thing about the thing that makes Ichabod Crane a villain in the story is not so much that he's a goofball; it's that he's. Um, kind of like social climbing. He's like really yeah. grasping and selfish. Yeah. Like he goes to the parties and, you know, he's, he eats all their food and then he's like, he's trying to like better his status by like yeah. kind of using people like on his yeah. way up. So I think that it's more, he's more like kind of, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say manipulative, but he does have a little bit of that where he's always trying to like make his status better. You yeah. know what I mean? So... It's also kind of implied, and as as far as I remember, like because like I said, I read it about a year ago, that he doesn't really. I mean, maybe he has feelings for Katrina, but he may he mostly wants to marry her because her dad is rich, like because he yeah. wants to. So he's kind of like that kind of motherfucker. That's kind of how they were back then, though. Yeah, I mean, but yeah. the, but they're. I mean, the whole point yeah. of the story, the original short story, was that he was kind of the bad guy. Yeah. And like the townsfolk were kind of like right to like run him out of town. Yeah. Like using the legend. Well, you ran freaks out of town back in. That's what I'm saying. That was written. Yeah. So interestingly, this movie, which you know, very much in line with Tim Burton's other stuff, because he's very much a champion of the outsider. Yeah. Um, you know, and culturally things are very different nowadays than they were back when the story was written in 1820. But so you have Ichabod Crane, who is a little bit less, he's a little bit dorky, but he's not like super dorky. I will note that Johnny Depp actually wanted to do the full on Ichabod Crane experience, like how he looks, like how he looks in the short story, like with his big old jug ears and those yeah. big, like creepy long fingers and that yeah. big, like long nose. And yeah. he's like all like arms and legs and elbows and stuff. Yeah. Like, like he's drawn in the Disney cartoon. Yeah. He wanted to do something like that. And gangly, I'm like, gangly kind of I'm gangly. like, I, I'm yeah. glad they didn't do that because that would have just been, I, I think that would have been a step too far. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Especially since they changed the character so much. Yeah. He still has the sort of like nervous, cowardly kind of shit, but he does actually like sack up yeah. and like yeah. do some shit. In the original story, they point out that uh, one, one time it's a pretty famous quote in that movie that um, because Ichabod Crane was a young single man and wasn't in anybody's debt, nobody cared about him. He could just disappear and people were like, oh, well, fuck it. Well, that's what they did at the yeah. end because they never yeah. found him, but they were like, oh, well, yeah. glad he's gone. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty much. Moral of the lesson, it was kind of like. It was kind of whether like, the headless horseman got yeah. him or Brom Bones got right. him. It was <laughs> one or the other. 1820s, but they were still, they were still like on the. Um, the damn folklore level of fucking uh, uh, Grimm's fairy tales, where uh, you you reach what you sow. If you uh, did something wrong, you got killed. You were a little kid, and you you talked with them people underneath the bridge. They ate you. You know, it's just like that. If you're a goofy son of a bitch and you're young, and you know nobody knows you, you they'll get rid of you. That's what I think. That's what the what the moral what the moral of that story was. Yeah. Don't be an outsider. Fit in. That's what the moral yeah, the exactly. story was. Exactly. Right. So like I said, the movie version is like yeah. the complete opposite. Because yeah. in the movie version, uh, you know, Johnny Depp playing Ichabod Crane, he's not a school teacher in this. He's actually a police constable and he's sent from the big city, like New York City. And he's kinda like at odds with uh, the authorities, even where he's from, because they're still kind of like barbaric and, you know, backwards and stuff. And he's trying to like bring in science and progress and they just don't want to fucking hear it. So they get like really annoyed with him always being like, yeah, but she, you know, he's supposed to be like this champion of like forensic science and reason and everything. And like I said, they are just he's not, kind of an imposter. They're though. not having it. He's kind of an imposter when you think about it though, because a lot of the stuff that he does, he's actually real grossed out by what he's doing. He does notice some stuff, but it looks kind of like some of the tools that he had custom made. I don't know if they actually worked. 
Do you think they actually were they actually working? Well, as I said, that, se that, that seemed to me that that was another thing that was hearkening back to like the yeah. Hammer films. It's like yeah. it didn't really matter whether they worked. Or, I mean, he did solve the mystery in yeah. the end, but I think that Depp was playing him. You know, yeah, he was a police constable and he'd probably seen some shit, but. I feel like when he came out, like, he had never seen anything like all these people being beheaded, and he'd never maybe had to get, like, up close and personal with the shit. So yeah, he was like a greenhorn. So, yeah, so he was kind of portraying but, him as, like, a little bit timid in that sense. Yeah. Wait, but I, I, he wait. did get the job done, though. The way I was interpreting it was is that he was intelligent, but he was kind of faking it, that he was, that he was real new to it, and he was trying to, trying to be more than what he really was in front of the other people who were watching him. So it, I kind of felt that he slightly had a little bit of an imposter uh, 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 phenomenon going on with him, where he was kind of faking. I, I thought well, I think he, he was, was trying to impress everybody. Right, right. Like, I, yeah. I think he did know what he was doing. Like, he was yeah. obviously intelligent. Um, yeah, he was kind of, like, goofy and had, like, some weird methods and stuff, but... He said some shit, though, that didn't really add up. Remember he said that that, bot, that head had been cut off by a sword, then and the sword had cauterized the wound, as if it was flaming. I didn't see a flaming. That that I didn't see the headless horseman use any flaming sword. Well, it was no. He didn't say it was flaming. He just said as though the blade was like really hot, like as hot yeah. as fire. Uh, and then like at which point, um, I think the reverend or something like that said, "Oh, like the devil's blade or the blade from hell or something like that." Yeah. So it wasn't supposed to be like a fiery because that was the thing. Like when he gets uh, stabbed by the by the um, by the horseman like later yeah. in the shoulder. Did it cauterize? It cauterized. Okay, so, so he did detect it right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All it right. did cauterize. But there's it's kind of like you'll see when you'll see in some of the scenes he ha he has this kind of air about himself like he's uh, not real secure in what he's doing and he's trying and he's hiding the fact that he's getting ready to throw up and all about things and it, it just he well looks because real greenhorn -ish, well know? the thing about it is that he's coming into this small town because like I said yeah. in New York City like Christopher Lee gets mad at him and yeah because yeah, Christopher Lee has a cameo in this which is great but they send him they're like hey why don't you go off to this like tiny little town uh, in upstate new york called yeah. sleepy hollow they bet they've had all these like really exciting like beheadings up there yeah. why don't you go try your methods out like in some small town yes. and see if it all works out because we're kind of like sick yeah. of all your scientific like, bullshit yeah because he had all the scientific forensic bullshit they didn't want to hear it and they didn't want to yeah, hear they it hear they're it. like no so, we just okay. want to beat people yeah, up for okay. confessions and then throw them in I the guess. dungeon <laughs> okay. so i guess so i guess he was legit he was legit yeah 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 they just didn't want to hear what he right. had to say. Like, yeah. the whole theme of the movie is that, and the reason that maybe he was acting like that when he came to Sleepy Hollow was because he probably saw himself as, like, the agent of change, the agent of progress. Mm -hmm. He's bringing science to this backward little town, and so he was trying to, like, put on, like, an air of authority, which right. maybe he didn't really feel that, obviously, right. because this was the first time he'd done that, mm -hmm. but... But I so I think it was like it was a good portrayal in that way because you could yeah. tell that maybe he thought oh you know I I don't really know he knew what he was doing but the movies he, were watchable I'd watch it, it is it yeah, is I'd I mean it. it's really really um I mean the best thing about it I think is the visuals it is yeah. beautiful it is a beautiful the beautiful movie to look stuff. at the costumes it yeah. actually uh, I think it won an Oscar for art direction if I'm not mistaken yeah. and I think it got nominated for costume design as well although it didn't I, I, I immediately um, saw the hammer influence in it but I'll tell you one thing though not as boobalicious as hammers that's true not as I mean there were some boobs and but, there yeah. was some but I was going like because you know, the, 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 the period costumes that they're using are basically damn push up uh, what do you call it damn things bustiers and stuff and the fucking well of course it and corsets and uh i was i knew christina ricci was in it and i was going like man we're gonna get we're, they're gonna break it off with christina ricci here man. they're gonna see her in that bustier it didn't it didn't happen it didn't happen although some of the witches i think kind of had a little little bit more like a hammer girl see because hammer horror if you guys never watch a hammer horror movie that was just uh it was it was it was a way of showcasing gorgeous European boobs. It was. Yeah. Just, and, and they were good actresses too now. All right. It's not like they would, it's not like LA where they just get some fucking porn star bibbo or something to dress her up. They were real actresses, but they, they were hotties. And then you'd have Christopher fucking, or Christopher Reeves in that. And Christopher have, Reeves. Or, excuse me, Christopher. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what am I talking about? You know what I'm talking about? The dude was in this movie. Uh, Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee. Sorry. <laughs> you'd have Christopher Lee in it and you'd have 
you know, uh, the dude that played Grand Moff Tarkin in it, you know, what's his name? Um, Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing. I'm drawing a blank on all those British guys. But they'd be in it, classing up the fucking joints. Hammer, Hammer made good, good flicks. They were fun. 60s stuff, you know? Yeah, and I mean, yeah, yeah you can definitely tell, like, you that, can see where he's coming that from. Tim it's Burton was, yeah. was into that. And like I said, you can see, like, it's, because it kind of looks like Black Sunday, too. Yeah. But the thing about it was Burton, initially, him and the cinematographer, they wanted to shoot this in black and white. Yeah. Uh, and they actually wanted to shoot it in the square, like the what yeah. they call the Academy ratio. Yeah. Um, but the you know Paramount, I think it was who made this, and they were like, absolutely not. Right. So what they decided to do instead was, well, they're like, well, if you can't film it in black and white, we're just gonna like drain most of the shit of color yeah. and then have that bright, bright blood. Yeah. So it looks like so that's pretty much what they did. Like they made everything just like really dark and shadowy. And I kind of feel like this is this is one of the best movies to watch like right around Halloween. This yeah. is a really good Halloween yeah. season it's visual. movie. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. very visual. And you know what's interesting too, and I didn't realize this Initially, they wanted to shoot this on locations. They wanted to shoot it actually in upstate New York, where the original story took place. So they went to Terrytown, and they were going to shoot it there, but they couldn't get it quite right, blah, blah, blah. And so in the end, they had to shoot it, or they, they ended up shooting it on, it's all shot on sound stages in England. Yeah. What I liked about it is that uh, the visuals were good. They were mostly realistic. Uh, they were kind of pretty much period, actually. Um, high end period and uh, you didn't have all that weird Nightmare Before Christmas and gothic style Tim Burton need fucking stretched fucking only a couple times did Tim Burton homage Tim Burton and that was like when you know, he would show a scarecrow or something you definitely like something that Tim Burton came up with yeah but I, the do, buildings, I do like that scarecrow but, though yeah but the, <laughs> the buildings and the architecture and the forest look like real places so, so I liked that yeah I liked that part you know and um I really liked the costumes, the um, the weapons that the guys were using, uh, when the Hessian uses uh, weapons. You see him with his hat on, too. Uh, fucking with uh, Christopher Walken. He looks good. His hair's all ratted out. And his teeth, teeth are, are all filed, filed down. down, and he looks all fucking crazy and shit. Yeah, he's, you, they're, he's, using, ah. he's using like a straight, long broadsword. Or, uh, and he's like... Or uh, Francois, which are battle axes. He had those. Um... Or tom in America later on they called tomahawks. We'd sell them to the Indians. The Indians loved those things too, and then they'd make their own. But the, the, that was a French weapon brought here during the French and Indian Wars, and even before that, it was used a lot. Um, Francaise. Some people might call it a Francaise. That's a fucking French battle axe, real light little, not the big fucking hokey bullshit. Had a little blade on it like a tomahawk. You could swing it fast. It was on a wooden pole about that big matter of fact i think i think i think uh gibson uses one in that movie the patriot during the revolutionary war dudes did use those they were good better than a sword if you knew how to use it so uh there was a lot of good combat with that we uh i even saw them, they had a wheel lock in one in one uh, episode one in one little uh scene they were on top of a damn stagecoach and um uh, uh, Giant Depp grabs a wheel lock, which a lot of people don't even know what that is, and he uses, he, he hits it, and pow, blow, shoots the fucking headless horseman with it. Normally, in the muzzle loading rifle, it's a, it's a flint lock. It's got a hammer that comes down to flint, a frizz, and a flash pan, boom. But there was a more expensive one that was a wheel that was, it was lit by a wheel that you cranked up, and when you hit the trigger, the wheel spun forward, and it was like the top of a Zippo lighter or a Bic lighter to make sparks, and it'd go whoosh. Like that, you need to get positive ignition, and that was a fucking high high speed weapon back in the 1600s. I think the 1500s might have had. No, I think it was 16 and 1700s. But uh, I, I was when I saw them. It, they always throw in flint locks, but when they included that wheel lock, I was impressed that they knew what that was. So well, yeah, somebody did their research. Somebody did their research. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Did you know too that when um, when the headless horseman is walking around San's head? Uh, that's actually not Christopher Walken. That's actually the dude that played Darth Maul. Okay. It's yeah. the same guy, like the stuntman. Yeah. So, yeah, you can see I really like, like, the way he spins that fucking... Yeah. And, dude, so many people get beheaded in this. So yeah. many. It was, I had forgotten... I mean, I remember seeing this theater, like I said, and being like, wow. Um, this is definitely, like, a, a horror movie. I think... I was watching another review, and I think 14... There are 14 beheadings in this, in this movie, uh, including a little kid. 
Uh, a yeah. little kid gets beheaded after seeing his mom get beheaded, and her yeah. mom, it, her, the mom's head like rolls off and like looks yeah. at him through the through the basement slats or whatever. And I was just like, man, that's fucking dark. Oh, and Brom Bones gets completely sliced in half, like, yeah. and there's like fucking blood everywhere. And now they did use some digital effects on this, but I think after what happened after Mars attacks. Tim Burton was kind of like, I kind of wanted to go like as little digital effects as possible. So obviously the Headless Horseman kind of stuff, they had, you know, the stuntman with the, uh, you know, blue thing over his head or the green thing over his head so they could rub it out digitally. But they did like mostly practical effects in this. And honestly, it looks pretty fucking great. Like all the heads and shit like that. All the beheadings are like really gruesome and I really liked that about it. Um... I will say that I kind of feel like the story is a little bit convoluted, but that's okay. It doesn't really bother me all that much because it's set up more like a mystery, like because he's yeah. a detective and he comes there and then he figures out, well, all these people that are getting beheaded, like something must link all of them. And so it's kind of like this thing where he has to figure out what the fuck's going on and I like, too, that he comes in and he's, like, this champion of science and everything like that. But when pre presented uh, evidence with his, uh, you know, by his own eyes that the supernatural Headless Horseman exists, he accepts it. He's like, oh, well, I saw it, so I guess it must exist. Yeah. I was, and actually, that's my favorite scene, like, after he first sees it and he, like, is wigging out, as you would. Um, and he's like in the bed going, the headless horse, it was headless, I saw it. And like the guy from, you know, the, the guys in the town are like, we know, we, we all told you yeah. that that's what it was. And it's like, so I just think that's so funny, like their fucking tone of that. But like I said, he, he freaks out, but then he comes out, he's like, okay, well, you know, I've, I've, I'm done with my freak out. Obviously this is supernatural and it exists. So I accept that. So now we have to like figure out how to defeat it or what the hell's going on with all this. So they do kind of set it up. I have seen some reviewers like compare this almost in structure at least to not only like a hammer food movie, but also like a giallo movie because it's kind of like a whodunit, which I guess like maybe a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's more like a Gothic mystery. Like I said, yeah. a detective, like a Sherlock Holmes type yeah. Type mister. I kind of feel it more like a Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, segment. a little too coherent to be Italian. Yeah, well, no, they're yeah. talking giallo in the sense of it being like a murder mystery where people get oh. picked off one by one and there's like something that links yeah, all of them. Yeah, but they didn't invent that. It's they like were, that. No, I know. I'm yeah, just saying. It's more like a gothic investment. And like I said, he did, yeah. I mean, he was influenced by Black Sunday, but that's not a giallo. That's a witch movie. Yeah. And, so, and this is a witch movie, too, because that's what witch it turns and, out that, yeah. yeah, the Headless Horseman, yes, he's supernatural, but he's being controlled by a witch who stole his skull. Yeah. Sold her soul to Satan, and she's like bumping off people, like yeah. to to Satan, get like some land and get revenge. Satan gets his due too, because that's uh, what I mean. Head of the Sourceman gets his head back, and once he's got his head back, he's like, oh well, now the witch that brought me here is fucking fair game. So she goes, he goes after her and well, yeah, picks she, her up like on her horse and shit. And fucking, she's, she's fine. She sold okay? her soul, and he's looking at her going, oh hell yeah, <laughs> and he fucking kisses her and blood starts running out because he's got them damn sharp teeth and he jumps and he's got her on the back of the horse and he jumps up and they go into the damn tree. Into the tree of death. Now her hand was sticking out of the limb so I guess it killed her but her soul went with him to yeah. To, well, to like help. I said, she says later on, yeah. like in her long exposition scene yeah. where she explains like why she summoned the horseman, yeah. um, is that when she was a little girl, like in the flashback earlier, you realize that little girl you saw in the flashback was her, yeah. that she saw the Hessian get killed. And she, at that moment, decided she was going to sell her soul to Satan. And yeah. then there was like this whole thing okay. that happened. And was then she, like that was came... she the little girl that broke the stick? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that okay. was her. All right, yeah. That was her. Up. So, and then the other little girl. So she got him killed. She broke the stick to alert yeah. the fucking authorities, and they, the, the Americans got him. Yeah. yeah. And then the other little girl was her sister, who was like the scary witch in the cave yeah. that Ichabod Crane goes to, like, for information. Yeah. You know what I mean? And she ended up killing her, too. So, I do, uh, you know what? I do like when Christopher Walken, <laughs> when the Headless Horseman, I do like when he gets his head back, like his skull back, and he kind of sticks it on there. Yeah. And then, like, all the stuff starts coming out. And then. He just couldn't. He couldn't resist. He, he had to get Tim. He Burton. had to have a large Marge moment. Yeah. Where <laughs> the eyeballs pop out and the tongue pops out a little. Yeah. Bit. He got but Tim Burtony. He got Tim Burtony there for a second, but that's okay. It looked like somebody Mars attacks. 
Like I said, it well, it looked like uh, Large yeah. Marge from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yeah, I didn't remember what that it, it was what it looked like. Either. You don't remember that scene? That's no. like that's the scene that everybody remembers oh, from that okay. movie, where Large Marge, the trucker, she tells him this scary story, uh, and then she turns and she says, "You know, it was a night just like this," and, and her face looked just like this, and turns for her, and her face goes all like yeah. eyeball popping out and stuff like that. So it kind of looks like that, but that's okay. That's like a little bit of self homage, I guess. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think Tim they're Burton homaging Tim Burton. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, yeah. he's he's that's what it feels that's like whenever his he prerogative. does it. Whenever he does it, it's like he's homaging. I kind of feel like a lot of people think that I don't know. Maybe we said this when we were talking about Mars Attacks, but I kind of feel like a lot of people think that you know, right around the late '90s was right when he started like losing, what like right when he kind of started going into maybe self parody. Yeah. Um, which I guess he did. He still made some good movies there. He made, like, Big Eyes, which was good, and, like, shit like that. But I do kind of feel like at that point, like, it, every movie past that was kind yeah. of, like, a greatest hits. Like, at, like I yeah. saw Alice in Wonderland, and I didn't love it. Like, visually, it was cool looking, but I didn't really like it as a movie. Yeah, and Willy Wonka came out. And then that Shaka was... Factor, I was like, yeah, That was yeah, terrible. Yeah, I really yeah. didn't like that at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, he did make some good shit in there, but I do kind of feel like... So I feel like maybe this one was, even though fans seem kind of divided on this, um, most of them say, yeah, it looks beautiful and stuff, but some people think that the, like, the plot's too convoluted or you know, it should have been closer to the you know, short story or something. Um, but I still think this is like a really good movie, especially to watch around Halloween time because it really has that vibe to it. But I will admit that probably after this one, I think, although when did Sweeney Todd come out? Because I liked Sweeney Todd. I liked Todd. that one. That was a good one, yeah. That, was that before this one or after this one? Hmm. After. Was it after? After. Yeah. What was it, 2001, 2004? No, I think Sweeney Todd might have sweet. No. I saw that in the theater, too, but I can't remember what I year it was. I thought that was a lot later than that. Maybe it I was. Thought that was like, I thought that was more like 2006. It might have been. Yeah. I mean, did, I, like think, I think we reviewed that, but I can't remember what year it came out. So that was still a good one. Yeah. I mean, it's not his material. Well, this isn't his material either. And like yeah. I said, he didn't originally develop this idea. The whole idea of Ichabod Crane being a detective from New York City and coming there to solve the beheadings, that wasn't Tim Burton's idea. That was Kevin Yeager's idea. Like, mm -hmm. he was the guy that first developed it, like the, you know, the Tales from the Crypt guy. So Tim Burton is, like, not working on his own. I kind of feel like maybe Tim Burton's stuff, other than Batman, maybe, I think his stuff is usually better when it's his own idea, like Beetlejuice. You know what I mean? Because that was, like, that was him, like, all the way yeah. through, like, Edward Scissorhands. I think it's better if he can just, like, design the whole thing from the ground up. Like, when he's doing other people's stuff like other people's ideas or he's adapting like someone else's novel or something like that. It's still good, but it's not quite the same because he doesn't have, it seems like he doesn't have like quite the same passion for it or. Yeah. Well, the thing was, is that that was the Tim Burton thing, the motif and everything, the vibe where he's coming from. It's the late eighties goth. Yeah. You know, an American late eighties goth. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the younger audience have no idea what the, <laughs> no idea what the fuck he's talking about. There's kind of like a big, uh, big cultural gap, especially between normies, you know. Uh, so from here on out, he's going to be very niche if he, unless he does something that's, like you said, something that's real unique. But it has to. I don't know. I'm not sure a Tim Burton type stuff would work anymore. It might. Yeah. I mean, it seems like the only people who go see the fucking superhero movies and shit, which are fucking terrible. Half of them. Most of them are terrible. Um, I don't know, Jim. I don't know about fucking Tim Burton anymore. Well, I like I said, I haven't seen... He would make movies that me and you would like, but I don't know if fucking that would sell. Yeah. You know? Well, like I said, this one made a lot of money, so, I mean, this is back that in the 90s. Then, yeah. yeah. I don't know about now. Yeah. I mean, he's older now, so right. it's just, so it's kind of like a different... It's different, uh, different time, different vibe. He's, at, he's in a different place now. And when, I, and right when, now. like, when his movie, like, when Beetlejuice and stuff like that came out, that was, like, really out there, and it was like, yeah. people were like, wow, check that out. Now I kind of feel like everybody's seen everything, so yeah. you can do, like, not what it was. you can do, like, some weird-ass shit and be like, yeah, that's some weird-ass shit, but like, no yeah. one's gonna... Meh. Yeah. 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 It's like, yeah, I seen weirder. You just, know what I mean? Well, uh, I think, I think, I think after what old, what's his name said, you know, and that, uh, after the, that, after that dude, you know, fucking after Chris Rock got slapped, fucking dude, that dude came on and goes, we're not the cool kids anymore. Fucking, and that's really kind of what it is. Hollywood studio, the big Hollywood studios, that, that's not the cool kids anymore. All the cool kids now are fucking making their own material. 
Yeah, well, like yeah. we said, because it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier, you yeah. Know? So it's it's harder to stand out nowadays, yeah. which is a blessing and a curse, I guess. Right. But yeah, I mean, honestly, let us know what you think about Sleepy Hollow, because I feel like this is one that, you know, a lot of people really like it, and then some people are just like, man, you know what I mean? Yeah. But to me, this seems like a really good, this is like the perfect Halloween movie, like to put on a Halloween party or some shit like that. I don't really care that much that it's not all that faithful to the story. I mean, it does have the little thing, a little scene with Brom Bones, like, dressed up like the yeah. Headless Horseman to, like, homage that. But I kind of like that he did his own shit with it. I mean, the Headless Horseman looks great. He's super scary. It's super gory. There's lots of beheadings, and I'm into that. So, and it's also kind of, like, darkly humorous as well, and it's got a great fucking cast, and it looks amazing, so... You know, I'm I'm happy. That's all I have yeah. to say. But yeah, so that'll do it for this movie retrospective. We will see you guys on the next one. Bye.